Number 10, Loki. Loki has shifted so much in comics. He's technically a different character from that original Loki that first appeared in Venus issue number 6 and again in Journey into Mystery issue number 85. Loki's look originally was pretty silly, especially if we're talking about trying to adapt that look to the big screen and make it look menacing. We do get a version of that sort of original costume in the Loki series when we see an older, bitter, and sadder Loki who actually more reflects that original costume and that original Loki. Loki now appears to look much cooler in the comics and is also much more versatile when it comes to their style. This has also translated to the big screen where Tom Hiddleston's Loki has also gotten more and more dapper and stylish as time has gone on as well. At least that's how I see it. Number 9, Harley Quinn. I know people love the original costume, so this might be like kind of a hot take, but I personally think Harley has had so many amazing costumes and looks over the years that have just improved on what was already, well, good. I'm not saying the original costume was bad, to be clear. So yeah, I'm not saying the original costume that she had was at the level of mm, some of the other ones on our list, <laughs> Loki, <laughs> being too much, you know, or too ridiculous, but I am saying that I think her design has only really improved with time. It's a compliment, Harley. Take it. Of course, not all of her looks have been winners in comparison to that original look, but I do think that her current outfit has definitely been one of her best that we've seen so far. And then of course, there is her whole Birds of Prey look, looks, which I loved, and her The Suicide Squad DCEU look, which seems to have been inspired by more modern Harley Quinn comics and video game designs. And to be clear, we're talking about James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, not not Suicide Squad, not David Ayer's Suicide Squad. Those are, those are two very different looks, are they not? <laughs> And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to hear about some more cool supervillain redesigns that we love, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, The Joker. The Joker is another character who has come a long way when it comes to his different looks. While his iconic face paint has remained, he's had many different outfits over the years and many different iconic pieces that we would identify as being part of his costume. Purple and green remain the Joker's colors, but instead of wearing a suit with like a ribbon looking tie that kind of reminds me of something like a child would wear like like a kid in the olden days or some kind of like floppy bolo tie he is typically seen more in a trench coat that happens to be purple also if anyone knows what that tie is called it's like a little bow but it's like a string let me know in the comments i don't know what that's called I do not know. The Joker looks less ridiculous and more menacing in modern comics, with the pranks of his earlier days also getting twisted along with his appearance. In more modern comic book tales, Joker has also been particularly terrifying, at one point having removed his face and stapled it back on in Death of the Family in 2011, and at another point sporting his own intimidating Joker-inspired bat suit during Joker War in 2020. Both of these are great looks, but very different looks. <laughs> Number 7, Drax the Destroyer. Thanks to the MCU, it's really hard to think of Drax the Destroyer in any other way. But the MCU's depiction actually borrows from the redesign of Drax from 2004. For this though, Drax here was, well he had a cape. Capes are cool, no doubt, no doubt, but um, I mean he's just so much better now. Take a look at his design when he was first introduced in the 1970s. Bright green skin with a very comic booky purple costume. It was unique, I'll, I'll give you that. but. As the rival to the mad titan Thanos, it's just nowhere near as imposing and intimidating as it should be. The 2004 design with the pale green skin, red tattoos, and knives evoke the kind of strength and power that comes from the title of The Destroyer. At number 6 we have The Flash. Looking at the Jay Garrick Golden Age Flash, we can all agree that there was room for improvement. Need I mention the elephant in the room? The silly hat? Okay, I know it has sentimental value, having been his father's World War I helmet, but it just doesn't look very cool. I'm sorry. And he would like he would use it as a weapon by throwing it at bad guys. Anyway, I'm just roasting him now. But when Barry Allen is introduced in 1956 with a new outfit, it seems like it was always meant to be that way. His helmet is replaced with a mask, and the little lightning bolts stick around, which we're happy to see. This costume then basically remains untouched until today, having undergone a few redesigns that didn't really stick, like Kid Flash, which I don't know. It doesn't do it for me. And the John Fox look, which once again, I don't know if it's the right decision for the character. I think the best place the design has found itself is Wally West's costume, which just gives the character a sleek look with lots of integrity. Number 5, 
Lobo. Okay, before you jump on me in the comments saying he's a villain, he's more of an anti-hero, okay? When Lobo first appeared in DC Comics, well, he looked like poo. You were more likely to laugh than to think he had any kind of strength going for him. He had an orange and light purple skin tight suit for Pete's sake. But when he reappeared with his biker motif, it just made sense. Ripped jeans, leather gloves and a vest. With all his craziness, foul language, weapons and spiked hair, he needed the rest of him to match. And I think we can all agree his iconic hook was definitely a worthwhile addition. Let's just forget about his newest New 52 redesign though. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> At number four, we have Iron Man. This is one of the biggest redesigns on the list, and for good reason. The old Iron Man is made to look like he's literally wearing a big suit of armor that Tony Stark would like crudely bolt himself into. But over time, with the way that the character's abilities become more advanced, so does the costume. It gets sleeker, more form-fitting, and the colors are toned down a bit, making for a more realistic look, tonally. Something I noticed that's a real eyesore from the original look is the design of the face. The original eye holes and mouth make Iron Man look kind of soulless, like there isn't even a person in the costume. And sometimes that was actually the case, but as Tony Stark's storyline is refined, it seems as though his costume gets less and less blocky as well. And this wasn't only the case for Iron Man, it was arguably the case for every other hero in this list and beyond. With comic books getting more legitimized over time, the depth of all the characters expanded, allowing for cooler, less fantastical designs that you might actually be able to imagine seeing in the real world. Number three, Kang the Conqueror. Okay. So Kang still looks pretty crazy, even in the comics, but he's come a long way from that wild purple and green eyesore when it comes to his cinematic appearance at least. We saw our first, likely of many, Kangs in the Disney Plus streaming series Loki. Here Kang was played by the amazing Jonathan Majors, and instead of sporting his very blue face and purple helmet, he was dressed simply in a nice purple robe with green tunic, pants and sandals underneath. A nice nod to the original design while still providing its own unique take on his look. Look, and a take that is quite a bit more sensible and stylish. Still, an air of flamboyance in how he's dressed, but not so over the top that it undermines how intense, inevitable, and intimidating he who remains, aka an alternate Kang, appears to be here. Number two, Lex Luthor. Lex looks a lot cooler and a lot more dapper in modern comics than his original appearance. Remember when he used to wear a purple suit with green pants? What is it with villains in purple and green? Especially over at DC. What's going on over there? It's kind of a very shocking combo of colors, especially for someone like Lex. Although I will admit, put it into a mech type suit, gloss it up a bit, and it works a little better for me. I do like it. Lex used to wear this purple suit with straps across over it, and a very Dracula-esque high collar with bright green pants and purple boots. Fortunately, he now more keeps to suit and tie looks, looking a lot more polished and refined, and occasionally mixes in some badass mechanical armor, which makes him look a lot more intimidating than that collar ever did. Number one, Killmonger. Talk about villains who have seen an upgrade. In Jungle Action issue number six, we got our first look at Killmonger. I don't even think you'd recognize him today if your main experience with this character came from the Marvel Marvel Cinematic Universe film, Black Panther, and Michael B. Jordan's portrayal of him. The original look for Killmonger involved a lot of spikes, as opposed to a lot of horrifying scars. He didn't initially mark himself for his kills, instead, he was just really pointy. He also wore white pants and a red sash, with no shirt initially. We've come a long way since then, with Killmonger having even been to space and back, where he ruled over the Wakandan space empire. And thankfully, his look has changed quite a lot since then. I'm partial to his symbiote look personally. Still a little spiky, but you know, it doesn't overdo it. Nothing wrong with a little bit of spikes, you just don't want to have too many. Number 10, Superman. This version of Superman, the one in the Kingdom Come story by Mark Wade with art by Alex Ross and Mike Carlin, is set in an alternate reality, Earth-22. Meaning, it isn't a baseline redesign for the character. For that matter, it isn't even a complete overhaul of Superman's costume. The only difference they made to the costume was that Clark's hair had silver streaks to show his age, and the yellow parts of his emblem were changed to black. Otherwise, his costume was a very classic Superman getup. But those two little changes, plus just the overall style of the art itself, did something to this Superman that for me, it just makes it just makes me tingle, you know? Number nine, 
Daredevil. When Daredevil first came out on the scene in 1964, his look was different from the one most readers are used to. Instead of his normal color scheme, Daredevil instead had a predominantly yellow suit, with only parts of the suit being the familiar red color. Now, in my humble opinion, the yellow and red suit has its own perks. The overall design of the suit is fairly similar to what would come later, but I will agree that when he showed up in Daredevil number 7 with the all red suit, courtesy of artist Wally Wood, it was an instant stick. It was more in keeping with the darker, brooding, street level nature of his stories, and it stuck for, well, pretty much the rest of his publication. Hey guys, before we go on, I just wanna say a quick little thanks for watching. I also wanna say thanks for those of you that leave comments below. I read a lot of them, and you guys always have interesting and helpful things to say, so thanks. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I won't forget to get on with this video. Number eight, the Punisher logo. Okay, I wanna talk about this one for a couple of reasons, but let's just say it. Straight up, it's controversial which always makes for a good discussion. Basically, the classic Punisher logo that has been around since the 70s got a bit of a redesign this year. Punisher has joined the hand, and in doing so, he has changed his logo to resemble that of an Oni. There's also reason to believe that the symbol may reflect his status within the organization. Unfortunately, there is also a real world political reason for the change. The logo itself was being adopted by real world police officers, which it's kind of odd considering Punisher is pretty anti-authority, and was even worn by some of those who were involved in the Capitol riots, leading Marvel to make a politically motivated change. Love it or hate it, it is the new look for the character right now. I'm not totally opposed to it, but I know at least a few of you guys out there are a little upset. Let me know what you think below. Number seven, Toad. Toad has also had a lot of different looks throughout the years, with his original one being the most ridiculous. <laughs> and also fitting, but also so ridiculous. But I'd say the real cool thing about Toad is that a lot of the time his outfits actually really reflect how he's feeling inside and his evolution as a character. This is why at first it's really no surprise that Toad basically is dressed up as a court jester in his first appearances. At that time, that was basically what he was, acting as Magneto's often disappointing goon who wanted nothing more than to please his master, but usually kind of failed at doing so. Toad? As time went on, Toad would come to realize that he didn't actually need to settle for Magneto's mistreatment of him, and that he was no longer really indebted to Magneto. In various depictions of the character, he'd become somewhat more independent, and sometimes a lot more Toad-like in terms of his design. Fox X-Men movies, I'm looking at you. And in terms of his roles, he also even went from being a villain at Magneto's side in the comics to kind of a weird ally of the X-Men when he became the school janitor in Wolverine and the X-Men. Remember when that happened? He also at one point got a flaming tongue, so he's changed a lot. I don't know if I'm as here for the weird green flaming tongue, but I definitely feel like his look is a lot better now than it was before. Also like that he's kind of like a hacker now. I think that's cool. Number six, the Riddler. The Riddler originally looked Jim Carrey levels of Riddler ridiculous when he first appeared in Detective Comics issue 140. And that's not a slight to Jim Carrey, by the way. I still love that version of the Riddler. Just also a side note, when I call things ridiculous or weird, it's not, it's not necessarily an insult coming from me. And while I do have respect for the Riddler's original question mark suit, I don't think it's necessary for him to be covered in question marks so that we know he's the Riddler. He likes riddles. We get it. Riddler has had a ton of redesigns since that first appearance, with a good number of his modern takes being much improved on in comparison. Okay, so not all of the modern takes on the Riddler have been great. See Riddler with his hair shaved into a question mark shaped green mohawk. That was a weird time. But overall, I think we can say we've seen a marked improvement. I also do love the recent redesign with Paul Dano playing the Riddler in the Batman film. I feel like this design for the character was definitely one of the most terrifying looks for him yet, and also fit really well with his origin and his backstory, and just with the overall tone of that film, which takes inspiration from the comics, but very much grounds the character of the Riddler in reality, giving him more power as well in the process. I think. Like when you make it just not about like silly riddles and you make it about like what is the Riddler and why are there riddles and what is this really about? I mean, it's a powerful character. Number five, Cheetah. I mean, the Cheetah outfit has changed a lot since her first appearance, and so has the character. The first Cheetah villain we were ever introduced to in the pages of 1943's Wonder Woman issue number six is no longer the Cheetah we have in comics. 
literally. Much has changed about the character, including her identity, her origin, and her overall look and power set. The original Cheetah was Priscilla Rich, a jealous debutante who dressed up in a skin tight Cheetah onesie. It's a look, I gotta say. Now we have Barbara Minerva as the main cheetah, who instead of dressing up, actually has a humanoid cheetah form, having been transformed basically by a god. Very different looks and takes on this character, but I definitely say that Minerva's is better overall. Sorry, Priscilla. It's just cooler. Like, I mean, then you get to actually kind of fight like a cheetah lady, as opposed to just a lady in a cheetah costume. <laughs> Number 4. Crime Syndicate The Crime Syndicate have always been cool, but over the years their looks have gotten a lot more detailed, badass, and in some cases, a lot hotter. I'm here for the sexy Crime Syndicate, I must say. I'm feeling it. The Crime Syndicate are actually one of the earliest villain teams to take on the Justice League, making their first appearance in 1964 in Justice League of America issue number 29. At least the earlier continuity version of that team, that is. Because this is DC we're talking about here, so you know, now we're on Prime Earth and that was before that, but anyways. Back then their outfits were less sleek and more blocky, such was the time. They were also a lot less sexy back then overall as a team, and had a lot less independent flair with their looks being just a little bit more rough and basically similar adaptations of the team members that they were mirroring. I mean, Owlman literally has Batman's look from like the neck down almost exactly, with only the stark owl on his head setting him apart. It's a look. Number three. Ultimate's Hawkeye. The Ultimate Universe in Marvel sees a lot of changes to character designs that honestly kind of reflect the MCU looks just a little bit. Overall, I think the outfits are improvements on the originals. I want to give a big nod to Ultimate Thor. But I think the best of the character overhauls would have to be Hawkeye's Ultimate Universe costume. The black vest, the crew cut, and the red glasses make him look even more like a secret agent, which he is. It's also a bit edgier and darker than his 616 counterpart, which most of the Ultimates are considering the comics were aimed at teens. Fight me in the comments, but I definitely prefer this costume. Number 2. Batgirl. Batgirl first appeared in Detective Comics 359, sporting an all black costume with a yellow bat symbol, belt, boots, and gloves. Personally, I didn't have much of a problem with this look. I thought it was simple, for sure, and quite basic. Just like the other members of the Bat family, Barbara Gordon also got a ton of redesigns through the years. But in 2014, when she got a redesign thanks to artists Cameron Stort, Brendan Fletcher, and Babs Tarr, the new look, much like Damien's Robin suit, just made more sense. The costume was much more practical. More of a jacket kind of design with a removable cape. The belt was more casual, more like a holster design. Her design had much more personality too, this way. Which really works for the character herself, who also has a strong personality. Number 1. Nightwing Nightwing first appeared, after leaving the Bat Family, in Tales of the Teen Titans Volume 1, Number 44. And his costume was, honestly, not too bad. It was goofy for sure. Don't get me started on the collar, but with those gold wing designs, it was pretty cool. I'd be a fool though if I didn't say that the blue V costume that debuted in 1996 is the best suit that character has ever worn. If we don't take into account his newest DC Rebirth suit, which is basically just a slightly updated version of this one. The simple blue bird across the chest and into the arms, mixed with the rest of the suit being black, yeah, it's a simpler look, but one that ultimately works better than any other. At number 10 we have Green Lantern's Power Ring upgrade that allows the rings to communicate with the other Green Lanterns in the universe. This feature added by the Guardians of the Universe is a huge upgrade that gives the ring a major advantage. Although there has always been an emergency beacon offered as part of the ring's powers, this is only meant to be used to relay to other Green Lanterns in times of distress. The homing beacon is a fantastic way to bring all the powers of the Green Lanterns together at any time giving them that extra support whenever it's needed. Or even aside from combat situations, this is a great power to allow Green Lanterns to communicate with one another about strategy to better prepare themselves in the planning stages. Considering there are plenty of Green Lanterns throughout the universe, it would otherwise be extremely difficult to ensure that everyone is where they need to be at any given moment. Pretty nifty. And an underrated ability if you ask me. At number 9 we have Sam Wilson's Captain America suit. This is a huge upgrade for this suit, giving it vibranium wings, gatling guns, and a nice little clip for the shield right on his back. While Captain America's suit usually doesn't change very drastically over the years, it's 
Pretty obvious that it's due to the fact that Cap is strong enough that he doesn't need to rely on his suit to help him. He's usually more of a leader with his most valuable assets being his military strategy and brute strength. But when he hands off the moniker to Falcon, the classic suit and shield get a huge upgrade. And not because Falcon needs the support of his suit, but because... Why not? I mean, Falcon has to have wings, so already a Captain America suit with wings is enough. But throwing those guns on it really brings the suit to a new level. And he still gets to keep the shield. I think a mortal retired Steve Rogers will sleep soundly at night knowing Sam is on the job with this upgraded suit. At number 8 we have Captain Marvel's Nega Bands. Although you may know Marvel's suit as already having the Nega Bands as part of the package, this wasn't always the case. Before he acquires them he is still extremely powerful from being empowered by a cosmic entity named Zoe later properly realized as Eon. He's able to fly faster than light speed, has superhuman strength, and is also able to teleport anywhere in the universe instantly. So it's hard to imagine how a suit upgrade would offer any sort of improvement, but it does. When the Nega Bands are added to the equation, Marvel is then able to travel between reality and the negative zone whenever he wants. But that's not all. At all. He can also absorb any energy that is coming at him be it a powerful blast from an enemy or even the energy of the sun. They are also capable of providing healing powers and increased strength. They even keep the wearer from requiring food, air, water, and sleep, which is pretty helpful. They do have their limitations though. They don't protect from drowning or gas-based attacks. And this actually leads to Captain Marvel's demise when he's inflicted with a poison gas by Nitro that actually gives him terminal cancer. But anyway, let's not get too dark here. These Nega Bands are a huge upgrade for Marvel and that's all that matters in terms of this suit. Number seven. X-Men. I don't know if you know what the original costumes of the X-Men looked like back in the day. Yellow and dark navy blue with yellow and black boots and gloves. Except for Beast who was still vaguely human and didn't wear boots or gloves and Iceman who was more like Snowman. The matching costumes definitely show that this was a team even with their different and unique mutant abilities. There have been many iterations of X-Men costumes since but for me when the characters themselves got their own individual costumes in issue 39 of the comic, that's when they really came into their own. The leader of the team, Cyclops, has generally used this look and variations on this look ever since. Mostly. The other members took a bit more time to find iconic looks, namely Angel and Beast, who eventually got his blue fur. Number 6. Star-Lord. When Star-Lord showed up in Marvel Preview number 4, he was a far cry away from what most fans have come to recognize him as. I think he kind of looks a lot like Owlman from the Watchmen comics to be honest, but even Peter's personality was much different. The tagline on the comic was, he stalks the galaxy, one man on a mission of cosmic vengeance. That doesn't sound like the typical wisecracking, sarcastic young hero we know today. Even before Chris Pratt took on the character, Star-Lord was revamped in the 2006 and 2007 Annihilation event where he formed the Guardians of the Galaxy and got an incredible new costume change. Ditching the more cow-like headpiece for a full helmet and the skin-tight outfit for a more loose-fitting uniform. It just gives his character a much more distinctive look, in my opinion. Number 5. Green Lantern Technically, this point can be argued with. This isn't so much a redesign as a wholly different character. But ask anyone who isn't deeply knowledgeable of the comics who the original Green Lantern is, and you're likely to hear them say Hal Jordan. Now, I'm just guessing here, but I think that has a lot to do with the fact that Hal Jordan's look, compared to the one of Alan Scott, is just so much more iconic. Alan Scott sported a black cape with a red collared top, green pants, and a sweet normal looking belt. Sure, he is a different character and not technically an official Green Lantern, but when Hal Jordan came in with a green and black suit with hints of white, it just stuck. Let's just not talk about the movie version, okay? Number 4. Robin Damien Wayne We talked about Batman in the last video, so it's only fair we talk about his ward. Specifically, I want to talk about the costume of the newest Robin, and Batman's son, Damien Wayne. If we go back in time and look at the classic original Robin's costume, well, let's just say it kind of goes with the costume of the Cape Crusader at the time. In other words, it's incredibly impractical. I'm also thinking the bare legs wouldn't bode too well in the streets of Gotham, but that's just me. The costume was evolved over the years for sure, but the one that Damien wears when he appears as Robin in 2006, it's just like 
Ooh, I like it. You know, it's kind of hard to get specific on what makes this one so much better, I'll be honest. But if we just slap up some comparison picks, I mean, it's just better. At number three, we've got Iron Man's Hulkbuster suit, which is an insanely powerful upgrade to the typical Iron Man suit as you can probably already tell by the name. Now, just like Spidey, Iron Man has seen tons of different iterations of his suit. But in this case, this upgrade has a very specific function, to bust the Hulk, to fight the Hulk, yes. The goal is to get the suit to a point where it's ready to take on the Hulk. Otherwise known as Iron Man's Mark 44 armor, this upgrade gives Tony Stark all the tools he needs to take down a bad guy bigger than those he's used to. This thing has a missile launcher, a grappling hook, and something called automatic prehensile propulsion technology, which is basically a function that allows the armor to assemble on its own when it's called upon. And considering the Hulk's impulsive reputation, this feature would probably come in handy if the Hulk suddenly decided he wasn't on Tony's side anymore. On top of all this, he's got the built-in rams, which are used to add that extra oomph to Iron Man's punches. And if he decides that brute force is no use against the green giant, he's also got sleeping gas built into this thing. Although it's not super useful in the movies, this feature will definitely find its benefit at some point down the line if applied properly. At number two are Spider-Man's Web Shooters. I know this is the second Spider-Man upgrade on this list, but it's just a classic upgrade that must be mentioned. I mean, I would even argue that this is the ultimate superhero suit upgrade. And what makes this one really special is that it's the first time we're really shown how much of a scientific genius Peter Parker is. Sure, his character is established on the basis that he's very smart and proficient in biology, but this invention basically allows him to be Spider-Man. Not only does he design the shooters themselves, but he creates the web fluid, which is arguably one of the most useful and durable materials in the world. This list features plenty of upgrades that take an already powerful suit and bring it to a new level, but this entry is an upgrade that turns a guy with superhuman strength and reflexes into, well, Spider-Man. We all know about this one, and it's almost seen as a given at this point, but it really deserves credit for what it really is and was at the time of its creation. A huge step into Spider-Man's career as a superhero. All right, at number one, we have the Batman Justice Buster upgrade, which ranks high on the list because once again, the word upgrade is a total understatement on this one. I break this one down in more depth than the top 10 Batman suits list, but basically, this suit is designed to take on the Justice League. So every element of this suit has some sort of benefit against each of the members of the Justice League, giving the mortal, Bruce Wayne, an unmatched advantage against any opponents, not just the Justice League. Considering the suit he dons before the Justice Buster is just his typical costume, having a mechanized suit that has processors that work faster than the Flash can move is a pretty big upgrade. And besides the many features specific for taking down the members of the Justice League, this suit just has huge defense stats and attack strength that would help Bruce in any combat situation. Number 10, Nova. All right, starting off our little list today is going to actually be more of a different version of a character of the same name rather than a redesign. There have been multiple Nova Primes throughout the history of the universe. Richard Ryder is absolutely the main one, and he is fantastic. I absolutely adore his Nova Prime costume. But when we first saw Samuel Alexander in point one number one in 2011 sporting the black Nova helmet, I'm sorry, it just did something special for me. I really enjoy it. Granted, being a younger, more slender guy, he doesn't exude the same kind of power that Richard Ryder does. But that doesn't make him any less powerful, and it doesn't make his costume any less impressive. Also, Disney, if you're listening, let me play Samuel Alexander, please. I want to wear his costume. Thank you. Number 9. Beast. We mentioned in the last video the way the X-Men uniforms were all essentially variations of the same costume. Hank McCoy was a shorter, stocky guy. He had huge hands and feet, and his original costume didn't even have gloves or boots, which helped him to stand out even more. Hank was the bruiser on the team for sure, with his mutations being strength and agility. But while he may have been a somewhat odd looking guy, he was still fairly human looking. That is, until Amazing Adventures number 11 in 1972. Hank got a job at Roxxon, Basically, where he developed a serum that acted as a catalyst for activating latent mutations for short periods of time. And then he drank it. 
The effects of this serum ended up making Hank grow gray fur. His muscles expanded, his ears became large and pointed, he got claws, and his canine teeth grew and became fangs. The serum further increased his superhuman agility, endurance, speed, and strength, as well as enhancing his senses. In Amazing Adventures 14, his fur would become blue thanks to Quasimodo, and he's been the same ever since. Whoa, 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 slow your roll there. I gotta talk about how great you are. Every time you like and subscribe, it sends a ripple through the YouTube algorithm that makes this channel look just a bit more attractive. So thanks for doing that. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook as well. And I'll carry on making this video. Number 8. Scarlet Witch Now, I don't know if everyone's seen the WandaVision show, but it's definitely one you should check out if you are a Marvel fan. One of the best parts, at least for me, was seeing Wanda Maximoff get a new look. A look that pays homage to the origins of the character, but embraces a modern design, and just makes her look like a total badass. Which I think most of the fans out there have really been craving. Her powers in the MCU haven't always been all that they potentially could be, even though she outclasses almost every other hero in the MCU. But moving forward, I think we are definitely starting to see her break out of the shell, and this costume really embodies that. I am so excited to see her in the Multiverse of Madness. She is gonna be sick. At number seven is the Superman Godfall suit upgrade. Now, considering Superman's unmatched strength, he doesn't really have much use for upgrades in that regard, but this suit upgrade is all about the looks and the motorcycle. In the Superman Godfall storyline, Superman has lost his memory and is living in what appears to be a dystopian city called Kandor, alongside his wife Lila. It's a state we aren't used to seeing Superman in. He's got a job, working at a kitchen, and appears to be living a pretty human life, without even his secret identity needing to be hidden. And his costume is just... It's so cool and Blade Runner-esque with a Tron style motorcycle to boot. I mean, who doesn't want to see Superman having access to a motorcycle when he's facing off against dystopian villains? It's just a great reimagining of the character and the suit he wears. And I think it's a fair addition to this list. Upgrades don't always have to be based on abilities and features, you know. Looks matter too. Okay, at number six, I'm putting Blade's silver armor from Blade Vampire Hunter from 1999. Taking a break from the usual mysterious green or black trench coat, this suit offers a whole new image for Blade. Now, I don't know if I'd say this is his best look ever, but I will say that it's a big upgrade in terms of utility. Having armor seems like a pretty obvious call for a vampire hunter from the get-go, so when I found the silver armor, I knew it had to make an appearance on the list. And the main reason why this suit ranks higher on the list is that silver is known to be a weakness for vampires, which are naturally a threat to a vampire hunter. This suggests that aside from the defense upgrade, this suit also gives Brooks a huge added advantage against his typical foes, on top of the obvious protective advantage. Even though it only sticks around for two years, this is a good upgrade for the character that offers much more protection than his typical garb. With a silver chest plate and silver gauntlets, this costume just gives Eric Brooks a more reasonable level of protection and sort of fits him into the category of superhero a bit more at least in the traditional sense of how he looks. I still think it was the right move to bring him back to his original black leather jacket after the suit ran its course, but it is a good moment for Blade's armor in the grand scheme of things. At number five, we've got a controversial one, Wolverine's Heated Claws. Although this upgrade is known to be slightly silly and short lasting, I think it's probably one of the best straight up upgrades on this list. It's not an attachment or an aesthetic update, but a good old fashioned upgrade of the pre-existing power. And it's Wolverine's primary weapon of choice. So getting to keep using the same old equipment, except now it can heat up to extreme temperatures, that's pretty good. And what makes it even cooler is how the heated claws are formed. When Wolverine is resurrected from death, the excess energy left over from his body's healing process goes into his claws and brings the adamantium to extreme temperatures. Now remember, these claws are made of one of the most durable metals in the universe. So even though heated metal tends to soften, you shouldn't expect his adamantium claws to do the same. These things are driving right into any and every enemy like a hot knife through soft butter. Ew, that's a weird visual. 
But it's true, and not to mention, this dude just came back from the dead. So you can expect him to be pretty angry and ready to take it out on anyone in his way. Okay, at number four is the Iron Spider Suit. Now, this is such a huge upgrade that the word upgrade doesn't even do it justice. Now, if you've seen my list of the top 10 Spider-Man suits, you know that the hero has had many different suits and they are all useful in their own right. But this one is probably the most drastic change that the suit endures in the right direction. Designed by Tony Stark himself, this upgrade changes literally every aspect of the suit for the better. It gets these four spider legs with grips and cameras on the ends of them, allowing the wearer to use them to climb walls hands free as well as use the cameras to see around corners. He's also got the same internal HUD system as Iron Man's suit, giving him heightened senses using the computer's intel. Not to mention the sophisticated mask system that offers full filtration to keep him from facing a similar fate to Captain Marvel. And a gliding system, giving him more hang time between web swings. It's a huge upgrade to the suit that totally changes the game for Spider-Man and offers him a whole new set of capabilities with which to defend himself and to best all the bad guys. Number three, Batgirl Cassandra Cain. Okay, look, we talked about Batgirl in the last point, but we were talking about Barbara. If we want to get really into Batgirl designs that will knock your socks off, we don't have to look any farther than Cassandra Cain. Cassandra is the fourth Batgirl, and she is the daughter of David Cain and Lady Shiva, two assassins who raised and trained Cassandra to become the perfect warrior. She became the new Batgirl in Batman No Man's Land, and let me just say, if I was walking the streets of Gotham and I saw someone dressed like this, I would just move, like to a different city. It's so fitting for her, it's intimidating, it's intense, and if I was a criminal, it would give me nightmares. Number two, Blade. When Blade first appeared in Tomb of Dracula number 10, he had an interesting costume choice. Blade sported a collared jacket with a bandolier armed with stakes, riding boots, and let's not forget the super sweet yellow glasses. More of like a cool pirate with yellow goggles than a vampire hunter. He would have different variations of the costume. One that was actually pretty good was when he wore green goggles, a purple jacket and matching boots, green trousers and a yellow belt. But in Night Stalkers number one in the 90s, he finally showed up in the leather, sporting a leather jacket, all black clothing with the katanas. Of course, this was born out of the 90s, but it stuck. It has evolved over the years, but the key things introduced have stayed. The leather. The leather stuck. Number one. Storm. The X-Men Storm is one of the coolest looking characters in Marvel Comics, for me. And that fact only gets reinforced in the Marvel Dark Ages number 4, when she shows up in a Wakandan inspired gold and silver costume. It is absolutely stunning. Storm herself is an extremely fashion heavy member of the X-Men. She changes up her look often and it's usually in unique and awesome ways. Like I really, really liked when she had the mohawk. But this Wakanda costume just takes the absolute cake for me. It calls back to her original costume from the second Genesis X-Men, but it's regal as hell, which it should be when she's the queen of Wakanda. The designs are amazing, and if I saw her show up like this, I believe she was a goddess too. At number 10, we've got Aquaman. Looking specifically at the redesigns that occurred between the Super Friends era and the 90s look. There's no arguing that the Super Friends look is pretty corny. Some would say that any redesign would have made it better, but what went into making Aquaman go from looking like this to looking like this was a decision that not only changed the way we saw Aquaman, but how we knew him as well. Firstly, the original look has him extremely clean looking, like he's been untouched by any battle, which we all know isn't true. And maybe that's just how superheroes were illustrated back then. But the 90s look has him with a harpoon for a hand, no shirt, and this sweet metal chest piece that just makes him look like he's really from the depths of the ocean. His trident also has a major redesign here that gives a more menacing look, like it's really designed to do real damage. And maybe it's not quite part of the costume, but the long hair and beard just seem like the right choice for Aquaman that should have been a thing from day one maybe. But maybe that's just me. Number nine, the Hulk. Now this isn't exactly a redesign, and I'll give you that. It's more like a mistake. It's a mistake that led to one of the most iconic characters for Marvel. When the Incredible Hulk first appeared in Marvel Comics, his skin was actually a gray color to keep him indistinguishable from any real world race, as Stanley wanted. But an issue with the colorist's ink actually led to the character coming out looking green, which, I mean, you still get the desired effect. Stan actually ended up liking the green more, 
and they stuck with it. Good call, Stan the Man. We miss you. Narratively, they even gave a reason for this. At first saying it was prolonged gamma exposure, and later saying that Grey Hulk was an alternate personality version of the Hulk. At number 8, we have Wolverine. Wolverine's costume has had many changes over the years, but the change from the original yellow look is a significant design choice in the right direction. The thing is, Wolverine looks pretty cool in the original X-Men uniform, but something about this darker look feels like it complements his personality more. The red eyes and the black gray tones in this outfit are so cool and much more menacing than the classic yellow tiger stripe design, which reflects what X-Force stands for as well. X-Force is a mutant organization put together by Wolverine himself, which applies lethal force if the mission calls for it. It makes sense that Wolverine would be behind something like this because of his inherent Machiavellian outlook on life. This character has lived for so long and through so much that his jadedness has become a staple to who he is. And this redesign just strikes me as being a more accurate portrayal of who Logan is behind the costume. Number seven, Deathstroke. We always gotta include at least one morally ambiguous character on these lists. But, at least this time, it's when he was actually acting as a hero. When Deathstroke was the leader of a superhero team, Defiance, he wore an awesome black and white costume. But not only did this costume change up his color scheme, he actually got a cape! Edna Mode would not approve. His black and orange color scheme is definitely a classic, and I'm not necessarily saying this is better, but I mean, it comes extremely close. It's better. And the story it belongs to is its such a good one. Check it out. Number six, Superman's black costume. All right, here we go. Look, he may have a mullet, but Superman in a black costume? I mean, come on. After the Man of Steel was resurrected in Superman Volume 2, number 81, after his death at the hands of Doomsday, he came back with an all black costume with silver symbol and wrist gauntlet type things. I don't know about you guys, and I, I know a lot of people hate that mullet, but you put any hero in black compared to their usual color scheme, and I'm here for it. The costume would get a revamp in the Justice League live action movie when Henry Cavill comes back to life, and it looked even better there. It may not have lasted too long, but I think this costume has a definite place in my favorite alternate superhero costumes. Number five, Monica Rambeau. When Monica Rambeau showed up in her costume in Amazing Spider-Man Annual number 16, it was a statement. I liked it, honestly. It was simple and unique. I don't really like the underarm wing things, they were kind of weird, but ultimately it worked for the time. She has been around for a long time, being part of the Avengers, Next Wave, and the Ultimates. But it was in the Next Wave number one where I think she got the best addition to her costume. All it took was a coat, and she instantly became so much cooler. The color of her under costume changed a bit, which it consistently does, but the jacket has now become a staple, and every time she's wearing it, I am swooning. Number four. Red Hood. When Jason Todd was killed by the Joker in Death of the Family, it was a huge thing. It was heartbreaking. It was brutal. It was visceral. Six months after his death, though, he was resurrected, and he was restored by Talia al Ghul in the Lazarus Pits. He would join and be trained by the League of Assassins, eventually leaving to pursue justice, although a bit more brutally than before. Enter the Red Hood, and an absolutely awesome new costume. Inspired by the original Red Hood costume worn by Joker, Jason's Red Hood costume is so much better. It's menacing and tactical and badass. I think I have a thing for jackets because, again, I love the frickin' jacket. Number one, Carol Danvers. The original Carol Danvers Miss Marvel costume is so incredibly different from her redesign as Captain Marvel that you'd be forgiven for thinking they were different people at first. Her Miss Marvel costume was characterized by a black leotard with a big yellow lightning bolt, bare legs, and black boots and gloves. While being an iconic costume, knowing what we know of her backstory and looking at the tone and personality of her character, it didn't seem right for Carol Danvers. When she jumped on the scene with her red and blue pilot-esque Captain Marvel uniform with the shorter hair and the star emblem, she exudes the confidence and strength that her character demands. She even still kept the red sash belt thing, which was probably my favorite part of her costume. This is the suit that inspired her MCU costume with not a single trace or mention of her Miss Marvel suit. It is also the suit that almost everyone has gotten to know her by and has completely revamped and reimagined her character. Mm -hmm.